to change the pictures. Okay, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Winter, as has previously been mentioned. Um, I am originally from uh, this country, somewhere up towards the top, and just to be clear, it's not that one. They're different. Um, these days, I live over on the other side of the uh, South Hampton Water, um, on the edge of the New Forest. Um, I am a freelance developer. Um, I work mostly with PHP, um, and I do lots of projects which use a database called FileMaker as a back end. Um, it sounds a bit odd, but it's a, a desktop database that has an API that lets you build, database, that lets you build web applications. Um, to, to be clear, um, I have no affiliation with New Relic, um, other than I happily pay them money every month. Um, I'm an end user, I'm not an expert, but as we go along, if you have questions, it's kind of hard in such a big room with so few people, but if you have questions, just yell out and I will try and answer them. Um, this is kind of my experience of introducing New Relic into a number of the web applications that I've built to help me understand what's going on once they go off my development machine and out into the big wide world. Um, so what is New Relic? Um, it's a software as a service application. Um, you obtain a license for it, which gives you a license key. Um, and you can then move on to do a whole range of different things with it. Um, the things that I'm going to talk about tonight are about application monitoring, um, monitoring of web applications through the browser, um, and server monitoring, because those are the three things that I use New Relic for. Um, you can also use it for uh, mobile application monitoring. So if you're a mobile developer, both iOS and Android, there is also a component for New Relic that allows you to do a whole lot of the similar sorts of monitoring for native applications running on those devices. Obviously, monitoring is not a lot of use without alerting, and there's a sophisticated series of alerts that you can set up to notify you when things are not going the way that you'd like them to. There are two other modules which I'll briefly demonstrate, um, which enable you to um, do the sort of uptime type monitoring um, of servers and services. Um, and also to drill into the data that you've collected from all of the different types of monitoring. So recently New Relic introduced this concept called Insights, which let you dig into that sort of data. Um, so as far as application monitoring goes, um, you start off with signing up, getting your license key, and then basically you have to install a PHP module onto your web server. Um, at present, there's no PHP agent for Windows, which means if you're using Windows to serve your PHP web applications, you're not going to be able to use New Relic for this. Um, I say it's almost as simple as an app get installed, you have to fiddle around with certificates getting trusted first. But basically, you install the module, you give it your license key, and away you go. Um, because it's a, um, a PHP module that gets installed um, through PHP info, you get a whole lot of data about what the module is doing, and there is a sophisticated set of configuration which you can choose to use. Um, I have changed one thing once, and I'm using New Relic on about 15 different servers for about 30 different applications. So the configuration is there, and if you're in a particularly secure environment, for example, there are ways that you can ensure that no customer data is sent through any of the monitoring that's done. There are a series of configuration steps that you can take to make sure that only exactly what you want going out happens. Essentially, what the PHP module is doing is it provides you with a couple of additional PHP functions, but it also installs essentially a proxy server, which sits on your server, and it listens for calls made through PHP, and it transmits data across the internet to New Relic. 
And that's pretty much it. Once you've done those two things, you've installed it and restarted your server, your web server, basically you sit there and you wait for data to turn up. It is a web application, it is a web service that's being used, so it's not quite real time. And we'll see in some data later on that some of the systems aren't 100% in sync with each other, but it's very, very close. When I say it's not real time, it usually takes somewhere around about 30 to 60 seconds for traffic that you know to have occurred to actually appear in your relic. No, no data is lost, there's just a little bit of a lag between um, the time at which uh, a traffic occurs for a web application, but it also monitors anything which happens in PHP through the command line as well. So if you're using a Symfony project and you're using the command line a lot, then all of that data is also sent through to New Relic. This is the main New Relic screen where the data that's been collected is presented to you. It's really hard to see on that screen, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, up, up here in the top right corner, there's a, a piece that talks about the AppDex score. And AppDex isn't a new relic concept, it's a, a general application monitoring concept. And basically, it talks about how whether your customers and clients is that it gives us a way to score whether or not the end users of your service are being satisfied by the service, whether they're tolerating it, or whether they're being frustrated by it. And so that AppDex is a way to try and measure the satisfaction of the users of your site. This blue line here, you want it to be as flat as it can be, and as close to the top as it can be. The idea being that you set a score, you set a value that you believe is an appropriate value for users. So for example, if you say that is that um, you, you set a value. So for argument's sake, you say that I want my score to be, I want all of my responses to be delivered within one second. So you set your index level at one, and then if data is returned or the, the response is received within one second, then it is said to be being satisfied. If it's between one times your index score and four times your index score, then it's said that users are tolerating and if it's greater than four times, then it says your service is frustrating to your users. And so AppDex is a way that you can measure and quantify whether or not your service is meeting the sort of performance that you want. Obviously, you can also put in alerting around that. One of the other things that's really useful in the bottom left corner here are these transactions. Shall I just take this <clears throat> um, Other transactions. Because what those transactions are is they show all of the queries, so not all the queries, all of the transactions, all of the requests effectively that are being made through your application. And that allows you to drill down into that process and see more about what's happening as part of that transaction. So getting transactions named and visible to you in New Relic is really important to be able to help you understand what's happening. And oftentimes what will end up happening is you'll probably be mapping transactions to routes in your application. New Relic comes with support for a number of different PHP frameworks. 
um, Drupal, WordPress, Symfony 2, and several others as well, which automatically takes care of that transaction naming for you. The Symfony 2 support is not great, and there's a, um, a secret bundle which some very clever fellow has built that does a much, much better job of processing um, the transaction naming, um, you, essentially using your, your routes. If you're writing your own code and you're not using the framework, or you're working outside of the supported areas of the framework, then into your, front contr into your controller, what you can do is you can add in a simple function call. Test to make sure the new relic extension exists, and then call this function, new relic name transaction. And essentially what that does is that identifies to new relic that everything that happens after that point in the code processing belongs to that transaction. So what that enables you to do is to group all of those transactions together, to monitor the performance of them, and you can also set things as being a key transaction which you can get alerts about if there are problems with it. For example, if your application is a, an online store and you're wanting to process transactions through a payment gateway, you want to make sure that that's working. So you can set those transactions through a payment gateway as being key transactions which you want to track more closely, which you want to get alerts about, and which also you can build in to the impact on your app deck score. So if you have a number of key transactions which you want to have delivered in a short period of time, or more reliably, then you can have them impact your app deck score, and which leads to alerts being sent. One of the other things that you can do is that you can name your application that allows you to use the same instance of New Relic to monitor multiple applications. It can be applications running on the same server, or it can be applications running across multiple different servers. The simplest way to go about doing that is through the Apache config, or through your web server config. This example is just for the Apache. Um, where basically you add in um, one of those configuration parameters into that, which means that as any transactions go through that particular web application, they end up in a specific bucket in your relic. And what you put in up there turns up in here on your new relic dashboard. As far as application monitoring goes, one of the really useful things that you can do is that you can set deployment markers. New Relic has an API which you can call through um, an HTTP post or GET um, to, to send a series of events and so on. Um, so whenever code is being deployed onto an application server somehow, then you can make a call as part of that to say, I am now releasing new code. Within that, you can send data about who's performing it. Obviously, the date and time are logged. You can also set data about the version that's being released and so on, which can be very, very useful. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about why that can be useful. The other thing that's probably the most useful bit and the part of New Relic that, when I first saw it, made me want to use it, is the ability to do stack traces. And basically, it's kind of like running Xdebug on your production environment. Because what you can see is you can see all of the application logic flow that's happening and the amount of time that each of the critical parts in that process is taking. As I said, there's a lot of alerting that's built in. Alerting can be tied to things like um, your app score dropping too low, your error rate becoming too high, um, various other metrics can be set through which you can get alerts. So now I'm going to attempt to do a live demo in the middle of a presentation. Um, which, you know, given that it's a web application, has the potential to go horribly wrong. Um, first thing I need to do is that I need to do this.
Ah, uh, sorry, this is New Relic. This is me logged into um, an application. And you can hopefully, through the fuzziness, not really make out much of what's going on, unfortunately. So, again, up in the top right corner, I've got my app dev score, which we talked about before. You can see that that little blue line is wiggling along somewhere right up there around about one, which is where we want it to be, because that means that we are satisfying the majority of our users with the requests that are coming through. You can see that throughput is being monitored below it, and then down the bottom here, we have those transactions that I was talking about as well. You can see that two days ago, there's a report down here at the bottom right corner to say that two days ago some guy called Steve Winter deployed revision R560 onto this application server. And so that's one of those deployment markers being put in place. This is, a, um, this is just a little dummy that I set up to, to kind of show you some of the, the value of those deployment markers. You can see here that this application was running along really quite happily. We had good response time. Um, you can see that there are two different bands being shown there. The lower one, which is actually blue, um, it is showing me the PHP response time. The green bar above it, which looks kind of yellowy there, that's showing an external service. I mentioned way back at the beginning that I do a lot of work with FileMaker, and FileMaker has to run on a Windows server, but ordinarily I run all of the web code on a Linux server. So that green band represents the time that it takes for the interactions between the web server and the external database server. For those of you who are used to working with MySQL, you'll be absolutely horrified at the size of that green line, because that green line means that a single database query, and that's all that's happening here, one single database query is taking somewhere around about 250 milliseconds, which is not great. The thing that I wanted to point out was you can see this blue colored vertical line that goes up. And if I hover over that, you'll see that it tells me that at 21.01 last night, Steve Winter did a deployment updating the new relic ID. Can, you get rid can I zoom in? Let's try that. So that basically shows, and you can see here that the point at which I made that deployment, something horribly, horribly, horrible went wrong. Because my response time went from somewhere around 250 milliseconds for my web code to taking something like an average of 2700 milliseconds. And so that's one of the real advantages of being able to place those deployment markers. Because what it enables us to do is see almost immediately that there is really something that is not good with that deployment. There is some problem there. Because all of a sudden we went from having a perfectly stable application that was giving our users a really consistent experience, and where you can see my app bit score is really high, and all of a sudden it plummets. Which means that my users had gone from being satisfied, probably right through tolerating them out the other side to frustrating. So now that we've been alerted to this problem, we'll have a look at alerts in a second. Now that we've been alerted to this problem, we can come in here and we can make use of the stack traces that New Relic captures to understand what's happening in the code and to try and help us figure out what's going on. So here's my transaction, which is taking the greatest amount of time. If I select that transaction, I start to see metrics about that specific transaction, just that transaction. 
This is a website. What it's doing is, this is returning an essay to a teacher who has to grade it. And it was returning, this essay was returning in you know, fractions of milliseconds. And now, all of a sudden, it's taking 10 seconds to return that thing. The consequence of that, of course, is that the throughput has plummeted significantly as well. If we come down and we take one of these transaction traces, we get to see what's happening in that transaction. You can see that there are a bunch of different blocks at the bottom here, and they represent different components of the transaction that's going on. Mostly, they're talking about different uh, method calls within the code. We take the trace details for this. You can see what I'm saying about how all of the steps in our code are being mapped out for us. So we can see that as this page started to load, a, a class called class auto loader, a function called access was called. Um, we did some initialization. We started to load our um, our HTML document. We headed off to a class called essay, which a bunch of methods ran. We disappeared off. We made that call out to the external FileMaker server, which you can see at that point had been by far and away the slowest thing that was happening. And then all of a sudden, we hit this method in our essay class called hang about a bit. Hmm. You can see that that took 10 seconds for that method to be completed. So now we immediately know that there are two points in our code that we need to look at. Can we do anything about this call, which takes you know, uh, about 1.25 seconds? Can we do anything about that? But most importantly, can we do something about this method call called hang about a bit? Well, if we nipped over to our development environment, we quickly find that hang about a bit does sleep 10. So we'll take that out. We'll redeploy our code and you'll, we'll see that things go happily back. We can get happily back. Happily back 15 minutes later to running in a stable way. Obviously, you would never have a method that had sleep 10 in it. But this was just a way for me to be able to demonstrate the sort of data that you can gather and then the way that you can use that to drill into that trace of the process that's been taken, the flow that's gone through your code in order to get from the initial request to the point at which something's gone back to the user in the browser. You can see in here that there are a series of alerts that have been being sent. And the ones, the only alerts that are configured for this application at present are when the affix score drops below a certain level. So these alerts, which you can't see because it's as fuzzy as anything, um, are telling us that the affix score got below 0.7 of a second at 1834 today and it lasted for nine minutes. So that's an alert that's been sent to let whomever is being alerted know that there is a problem that they need to take care of, or at least investigate. And so at that point they can come in and they can take a look at what was happening at that time. Within, within New Relic, when you are monitoring an application, Um, you can set a whole range of different parameters about what you're doing. So you can set that you want a custom date, and you can set a range that you want to look at, or you can just look at the last 60 minutes worth of transactions which have occurred on that particular application.
Are there any questions or observations about anything I've just been talking about? I can tell you not asleep, but maybe I'm just that boring. Yeah. Is there, do you know as much of an overhead with the staff rates that are being passed back and forth between your own service and your credit and all the data going around? Um, I, I can't quantify that for you, no, but I understand that it is very minimal um, because quite a bit of the initial data is captured on the server and then the new relic proxy which runs on the server sends that data out as and when it can. Um, so I, I know from um, looking at the server monitoring that the new relic, um, the components of new relic use very, very few um, system resources. They don't use very much RAM, and they don't use any CPU cycles so, to speak of. So they don't consume a lot of um, system resources, but obviously there is some network traffic that's going to be generated from it, but I don't imagine that it is particularly high. Um, I know that all of the traffic is um, JSON encoded, um, and it's all sent over HTTPS as well. Um, with your um, each individual request, does every single request um, send a um, every single request traced, or is it just certain requests that are sampled and then sent to new Reddit, or is it sort of some are fully traced and recorded, or but some are half or? Um, basically, everything everything that happens is tracked, traced, and sent. Um, what happens to it once it's received comes back to what you've done with your transaction name. If you're using a front-end controller such that everything goes through index.php, if you don't name your transactions, then everything just gets in a scrape of alarm called index.php because New Relic doesn't know what to do with it. At which point, this being able to dig into those transactions becomes virtually impossible. Um, so, yes, everything is traced and everything is sent, um, and you then need to do something to make that data more usable. Um, how in depth into PHP core does it go? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, let's say we've got a really simple app for uploading a photo. We've just got our PHP max file size set, and some person's got an amazing smartphone, huge file, tries to upload it, causes an error. I understand we can trace through to, you know, potentially which call has triggered that problem. Yeah. But has it got the ability to know that actually that generated a PHP error of so and so and to show that in the details? Um, yes, is the answer to that. Um, basically, if, if I look back in time a bit further to when I was mucking with this yesterday, too. Basically, at the point at which anything happens. So you can see here that there is an actual error that occurred at this point in time and it will tell you exactly what the error was. Um, and so it, it's telling me that there was a call to an undefined method SA hang about a bit. Um, so this was me um, trying to slow things down and cocking it up. Um, so, so yes, it, and it will capture um, PHP fatal errors as well. Um, so if you do get fatal errors, then you do get that data um, through. And it provides you um, with the stack trace that led up to the point at which that error occurred. So, yes, you, you will... I, I can't be 100% sure that it will tell you that it's because the file was too big, um, sure. but it will definitely stack trace all the way up to the point at which that fatal error occurred, and it will give you that, yeah, um, you know, right down to the line number that the path followed. How much information is actually sent to you about the request? Is it just the stack trace and the um, path that you're using, or is it more about it? Or does it include all um, sync labels? Or 
Um, that, is, that is configurable. Um, by default, I believe it's turned off, so that um, the actual request query and the request parameters and the post data, none of that stuff is sent, um, but you can enable the tracking of specific things in your code. So you can say that I, I want to track specific things that have come in as part of a request query and so on. But any of the you know, post dates or any of that sort of stuff, no, none of that is sent. So that's talking about application monitoring. I'm talking about it from the perspective of PHP because that's what I do and that's what I presume most of you do. Obviously, there are new relic application monitoring capabilities for pretty much any other language that you want to name. There are .NET agents, there are Python agents, there are agents for pretty much any language which is going to be used for writing web applications. A more generic uh, method of monitoring that's available is some browser monitoring. And essentially what that does is that it provides a similar sort of view into what's happening in your front-end code. And it provides details about the response time, um, the amount of processing time that's been taken for various parts of the page load, and so on. And then that sends data from the user's browser through Ajax, where supported, um, to New Relic as well. Essentially, to get that working, you have to put two tags into your template. Right at the very top, and that's not very useful, but that's not. Are you still zoomed in? Ah. Ooh. Switching back to A and plus six and then I think we definitely no, that. I actually think I'm and still the same thing. So try to get A plus six then. Okay. And then that's pretty good to try and run slides.
and then try to get the condition again. This is zoom on top of it. Zoom on top. So zoom in where? Um, on your menu next to view for a zoom at the center. In keynote. Yeah, but that's that's the zoom for keynote rather than for the operating system. Do you want to take the slide like that? Because we can hear it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah. Um, Firstly, command <coughs> option A for the big zoom. Sorry? Command option A. Thank you. Well, Google. Well. Thank you there, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, browser monitoring. So basically, you need to put two tags into. Um, the, the template into the HTML page that's being rendered. Um, one at the top immediately after the content type meta tag and one immediately before the closing body tag. They're PHP functions, but what they generate is a script tag um, which sets up uh, the monitoring that's going to occur in that page load. The one at the top is used to start timing metrics so that it's hitting the uh, browser as soon as possible and it allows for tracking of what's going on as the page loads. The one at the bottom is there to capture that data, process that data, send it off. But it also then continues to monitor what happens. So you can see when users scroll on a page, you can see when users click to move off the page and you can see right up until the point at which the unload request is called at the end of the page view as the user moves away. Now I'm going to try going back to So again, you get a similar sort of view. It's command alt a to get out all that. Um, so you get a similar sort of view, um, where, which shows you the different components of what's happening in the page view. You get to see the different parts of the process that are happening um, in that load time. You get to see the throughput by different browser types and so on. And you can also dig into the different traces that have occurred. These will be, unfortunately, almost impossible to see on that screen. Um, but basically, what they show is that they show all of the different interaction points and the different points along the load path of what's been happening in your browser. So you can see when various things happened as the user was making their way, or as the browser was making its way through loading. You can see the DOM loading and the various assets that are being loaded, the various tasks that are being done, what happens at each point along the way. You can see here that here's one of those calls that's being made to New Relic to monitor the traffic that's going on, to monitor what's happening within this application call. And then eventually, you can see all these set timeouts that occur. That's just New Relic sitting there waiting whilst the user is interacting with the page and periodically sending that data off. And then, we can see that the user is interacting with the page, data is being sent, and then eventually, get down to the fact that the last thing that happened was a before unload and then a page hide. This one's not very enlightening because the user didn't seem to do very much in that transaction. But basically you can see everything that's happened between the point at which the page first started to load and the point at which the page hide occurred, which is the, the end of 
the user's interaction with that page. Obviously, it doesn't track actual interactions like something like mouse flow would, but what it does let you do is it lets you see when users scroll, it lets you see when users click, and it lets you see those sorts of occurrences that happen as the page loading, as the page interaction is going on, as well as the page loading. Where your application is using a lot of AJAX, it can also track the various AJAX requests and the response times as well, the different AJAX queries that are being performed throughout the site. So if you're using a lot of AJAX, you will see quite a lot of data gathered in the AJAX response time, which can be very useful if you're trying to find out why a page isn't loading properly or why data isn't appearing in the way that you can expect. Because it may be that some of your API calls from your front-end code are taking much longer than you anticipate and that they're causing problems. So again, you can come in and you can drill down into here and you can drill down into each of the session traces and so on to see what has been happening in the user's front-end. Um, so, the, the, the third bit um, that I wanted to talk about was server monitoring. So, it's what, what this enables you to do is to monitor what's happening on your server. Um, it requires installing an additional agent onto your server. Um, there is one of these available for Windows. But it reports the server metrics um, into the same console, so into your new Relic application. There are lots of different tools out there for monitoring servers. But to me, the advantage of this is that it puts all of that data into the same place. Um, so if we take a look at the service tab here, all of the sorts of metrics that you would expect to see um, about a server are being shown to you. Um, so you can see the CPU, you, CPU usage, the memory usage, you can see the load average that's been going on, you can see all of the network traffic that's occurring, and you can also see the applications, as in the new Relic applications, that are running on that server, and the processes themselves that are running on there as well. So that you can monitor and track what's happening with the different processes, um, and what may be causing problems when they begin. As I said, there are loads of different tools that do this sort of thing for you, but for my mind, being able to have all of this in the same place is really useful. It also integrates in that you can set alerts in exactly the same way as you can for your application monitoring. You can also set alerts for your browser monitoring as well, so that you can know if there are problems with individual servers in your infrastructure. Um, I said that Insights was reasonably new. Insights essentially is a way that you can access all of that information that you've gathered. So far I've shown you that the three components that show you how New Relic thinks you should view your data. But the advantage with Insights is that it lets you query all of that monitored data in pretty much whatever way you like. It has an SQL-like query language which you can use to build those queries and to gather whatever information that you want and then you can present it however you like. You can build up dashboards of those sorts of metrics as well. Um, 
Um, so, as I said, there's a, a, struct, a query type language. Um, I've got a query that I ran here to look at the number of, um, or to, to look at um, operating system of requests. And basically, you can get that as a table, you can have that as a chart, a bar chart, or if you wanted to, you can also have it as a JSON feed. So for example, if you're using some kind of business warehouse to provide business metrics, you can create these structured insights queries, which then expose all of that data out to be accessed by other systems. And in that way, you can share that data elsewhere as well. You can see that um, up here, I'm just counting the page views, and then I'm faceting, grouping, um, faceting is the new Relic query language term, um, over the last seven days, and so on. But you can, you can group and query and facet by pretty much any of the metrics that you, um, that you are gathering or able to gather through either the browser monitoring or the, the application monitoring as well. Uh, synthetics is a component of New Relic which I don't use. Um, each of the components more or less uh, have a separate license cost associated with them. Um, and for me, I didn't see the value in that. I was already using another tool that does the sorts of things which synthetics does. Um, however, it lets you do that monitoring of uptime um, of transactions and API endpoints and so on. So it's kind of like a, a pingdom-like thing where you set up um, a, um, a rule that you want to have or a task that you want to have performed at regular intervals to go off and query to make sure that the site is up, that page is low, um, and that API endpoints respond and that type of thing. Um, I mentioned the mobile at the beginning, again, this is not something that I'm using, but basically you can include a code in your mobile applications which will do more or less the same thing as we've seen for the application monitoring as well. It, the question someone asked before about um, with your PHP and, and a fatal error and so on, one of the things that the mobile application does as well is that it's able to log crashes which occur of your application. I don't quite get how that can work but apparently. Um, so it may be something that people who, if you're doing mobile development, may be interested in looking into. Um, the, the last useful, well, the, the last aspect, and also a very useful aspect of New Relic that you can do is that it has a plugin architecture, which means that you can get plugins to enable you to monitor lots of other things through New Relic as well. Um, one of the ones that I'm using monitors um, uh, Rabbit in queue, queues. And so basically, it is um, a Python script which runs on the same server as your Rabbit, as Rabbit in queue does. And it uses the um, management API to access data about that. And then that just passes it through that New Relic proxy and out to New Relic as well so that you can manage data about your, um, your queues, the um, size of the, queue, the queues that exist, the number of queues, the number of messages, the message rate, and, and that type of thing. Um, and there are also plugins for all sorts of other web technologies as well that let you gather together all of those metrics into the same place so that you can get an overview of the entire infrastructure, not just your PHP application, but all the other bits that sit around the side of it as well. Does it cost? Yeah, it does. Um, and it's not cheap. Um, it is comparable to its competitors. But the one thing that I found when I talked to New Relic about wanting to use their service, they give you one, a 14 day free trial, and at the end of that, actual account manager rings you on your actual telephone to talk to you um, and I found that there is quite a bit of scope for negotiation um, when you're talking to that actual person 
because if you look at the outright pricing on the website, it does look a bit scary to begin with, but when you've actually started using it and you actually have a conversation with someone there, um, and they are really good at following up with trials, um, then there is, I found, room to negotiate a little as well. And that's me. Unless there are any further questions. Yep. Um, who do you consider the, the competitors? No, it's gone. I'll, I'll answer that question for you afterwards. I can't think of the name of it now. That there is another system that's very similar, that works in a very similar way. Sorry, I can't answer that. Uh, is a licensing for our server? Is it? If you're installing a PHP package, is it the cost per server? Um, no, it's it's per effectively it's per module that you want to use. So you pay for um, the application monitoring, and there is a cost associated with that. Um, and you can install that on multiple servers and multiple applications within that server as well. Um, the browser um, monitoring is a separate module which has a separate cost associated with it and with that you pay for the number of, re the number of requests per month that will be stored. Um, the, I think the starting one is 2 million requests per month and it kind of goes up from there depending on how many requests per month you want it to track. Um, the server monitoring is bundled in with application monitoring. Um, so you kind of get those two in the one cost. Yeah? Um, the, the browser reporting, does that log JavaScript errors as well? Yes. It does? Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, so long as they occur after it's started. Yeah. Um, which, is why, which is why the, it, you need to get the new relic code in right at the top or as yeah. close to the top of your page as you can within your template. Well, apologies for the um, slightly interesting technical issues. If anyone can explain to me how I can get back to Keynote. Oh, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Just to really thwart me. Right. Thanks very much.